We all know what a modding powerhouse the original Xbox was, but what about the even more successful Xbox 360? Homebrew-wise, the 360 has a way smaller modding scene than the original, and for good reason, it's a lot harder to do. Microsoft knew they dropped the ball security-wise with the OG, so they invested heavily into locking down the 360. And for the most part, they did a really good job. There was one semi-soft mod, <laughs> semi-soft early on where the DVD drive could be flashed to accept burned discs, but other than that, there haven't been any soft mods that provide the full modded experience of homebrew, emulators, running Linux, or running games off the hard drive. The only way to get that is hard modding, which only a small subset of modders have the skill set for. Additionally, the most common and reliable way of hard modding, known as the reset glitch hack, has a fairly complex installation process that isn't for the faint of heart. Now, the intricacies of the reset glitch hack are out of scope for this video, but basically when the CPU verifies the firmware signature, it runs something like a memcompare. If you know anything about memcompares, it's that if the two things being compared are the same, it returns a zero. By pulsing the reset pin of the CPU at just the right time for just the right duration, you can force the result of that mem compare to zero so the 360 will accept modified firmware. Now, I've had an RGH 360 for about three years or so, but back then, all methods required a separate module, a glitch chip, to send the pulse to the CPU. In practice, it's basically the same as installing a mod chip. The downside of this approach was that the glitch chip, being an entirely separate module, was kind of guessing when to send the pulse to the CPU. It's an educated guess, most glitch chips will temporarily slow down the CPU to make the chance of hitting the right time more likely, and you can tweak the chip's timing to better match your system, since naturally they'll all be a little bit different, but at the end of the day, there was a limit to how precise it could be. This means the reset glitch can, and does, fail. The console will restart if it does, giving the glitch chip a chance to keep trying indefinitely, but depending on how close you got the timing and honestly how lucky you are, it can take several attempts before it hits at just the right time. You can get a system that boots first try most of the time, but there's effectively always a degree of randomness to it. This was simply the reality of RGH modding until last year when RGH version 3 was discovered and published. For the first time, you could pull it off without a glitch chip at all, instead using a signal from the SMC chip that pulses at exactly the right time every time. This not only turns a 6-wire mod into a 2-wire mod, it also makes an infamously unreliable mod into one that works perfectly consistently. Technology that's easier to set up and works better? What more could you ask for? I'm upgrading mine because while it's fine and does work as is, the boot times can get a little long. Mine varies a lot, usually it boots within the first three tries, but sometimes I'll be sitting there for minutes before it actually starts up. Plus, I just want to try out the new thing and see what it's like. This is not a tutorial, obviously this will only apply to my specific model and yours might differ, but I will show you the overall installation process so you can get a feel for what's involved. For more in-depth guides suited for your system, I'll leave some links in the description. My model is a later slim model with the border vision known as Corona. Yes, I know that word means something very different now, but it's actually very common here. Most slim 360s will be Coronas. Now for me, this is the hardest part of all, just opening up the case. I don't know why, but when Microsoft designed the case for the 360 Slim, they built like the ninth circle of hell. There are plastic tabs everywhere and places that are impossible to reach. I think I spent 45 minutes this time just opening the case, and I'm sure it's taken other people even longer. It's genuinely the hardest video game console I've ever opened. But after that, everything else is straightforward. You'll want to get all the way down to the motherboard, including removing the heatsink, which is a good opportunity to replace the thermal grease, but we'll get to that later. First, I'll be removing my old glitch chip. Obviously, if you're installing this for the first time, you won't need this part, but the rest of the steps will be pretty much the same. Unfortunately, it looks like I stuck it in there with good old Aussie blue tack all those years ago and left a lot of residue on the board. Thankfully, alcohol cleaned it all off. Now to install the new mod. This is the part that will differ most depending on your board revision, but for me, it's two wires plus an optional 1K resistor that improves reliability. One of the points you'll need to solder to is not fully exposed on the board, so you'll need to scrape away a silk screen to get to it. I am installing the 1K resistor because I had a bunch lying around, but looking back, I really shouldn't have installed it like this. This resistor is bulky and may put unnecessary strain on the pad. It would have been better to stick it somewhere in between and wire both sides up to it. But other than that, technically, we're done. This is all we need to get the 360 to accept a modified firmware. Before we move on or do any testing, this is a good time to put our heatsink back on. And like I said, this is a good opportunity to replace the grease. There we go. Now, as for getting a modified firmware on there, we've got a few more major steps to get through. Namely, we'll need to temporarily solder a NAND flasher. 
This requires you to temporarily solder 7 additional wires, so I guess you could argue this briefly becomes a 9 wire mod. Even though my firmware was already modified, I still need to do this part again because the firmware needs to be slightly different for RGHV3. The rest is all on your computer. Using JRunner, you make a backup of your current NAND, it'll make two to ensure it read correctly. Then you'll want to temporarily write a completely new operating system to it called Zell, which lets you retrieve your console CPU key. You'll need to enter this back into JRunner so it can make the modified firmware. You have two options here. You can either retype it by hand or use Zell's built-in networking to grab it automatically. I usually just retype it. JRunner will tell you if it's wrong so you don't have to worry about making a mistake, but if I was doing a lot of these, I probably would set up the networking. Either way, now you can build your modified firmware, make sure to tick RGHV3, and write it to your system. If everything worked out, you'll now officially have a 360 that will happily run unsigned code. Whatever you do from here is up to you, but I recommend installing an alternate dashboard like Aurora from which you can easily start launching games and homebrew. I'll leave some tutorials for that too in the description. Now you can desolder the flasher and button it all back up. And maybe double check it's all still working before you put the case back on, just because reopening it would be such a pain in the ass. So is this now an easy mod? Well, it's hard to really say. In theory, it's not complicated, it's just soldering a couple of wires and flashing the firmware, but it's not beginner level soldering, it's definitely pretty precise surface mount stuff where all the points are pretty small. And there are a lot of steps to the process, which means a lot of opportunities for things to go wrong. So as much as I would love for more 360s out there to get RGH'd, I think if you're a beginner, you should still practice thoroughly on something less important first. But I absolutely think it's worth doing. Let me know if you enjoyed this video and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye guys.